So welcome everyone to our uh, very exciting, extra special uh, first WPD of, of fall 2021, where we have four of our very excellent students who will be telling us about their research that they did over this last summer. So we'll be going um, in order of the speakers listed here, starting with Juan. Unfortunately, Katie couldn't actually be here live, but I have a video of her talk, which we'll just watch, watch together. So you won't get to ask her questions. Although I'm sure if you wanted to email her, I'm sure she'd be happy to chat about her work. Their group just got some, some recent results, which are included the in, in the talk. So you'll actually be the first ones to hear about these results. Um, and then we'll continue to Natalie and we'll finish with Andrew, who are all here today. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, next week's WPD, I want to mention, is going to be at an abnormal time. It's going to be Tuesday at noon, so I'll send out an email and I'll be sure to mention this. Uh, it's going to be a very exciting, interesting talk, though, with Dr. Jarita Halbrook, who will be telling us about their work on cultural astronomy. So cultural astronomy, if you don't know what that means, there's one way to find out, and that's to come to WPD next week, again, at the special time of Tuesday at noon. Okay, so with that, I don't want to take too much of the, the students' time. So um, Juan uh, Garcia Vega is a junior here at Sonoma State University. He's a physics uh, BS student, and he's considering adding a minor in mathematics. Um, so with that, take it away, Juan. Thank you. Um, oh, got to get uh, the host oh, uh, on the screen share. Yeah, sorry. Um, one second, I have people joining. No, nope, that's not what I want to do. All right, thanks. Sorry about that. You should be able to screen share now. Cool. Oh, uh, gonna run through the slides very quick. Towards the end, don't look at anything. <laughs> Getting a All preview. Right. <laughs> Well, hello everyone. Uh, right, I'm Juan Jose Garcia Vega, uh, major in physics here in Sonoma State University. And what I did over the summer was observe supernova rates in different environments, uh, along with my advisors, Dr. Kelly Douglas and Dr. Sagev Benzvi uh, at the University of Rochester. So starting off, uh, basically, uh, I want to talk about the structure of the universe here. Uh, uh, the, the structure of the universe could be thought of as basically a, a cosmic web uh, where we have these super long filaments of uh, a dense uh, of dense matter uh, in these darker shaded areas that you could see here in the simulated uh, version. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's these pockets of emptiness that we uh, that we call voids. Um, so we have here the simulated version and then the observed version that uh, SDSS created, uh, which is a slow and digital sky survey, and uh, they focus on uh, 3D imaging uh, or 3D mapping of the universe, right? And so this is about uh, one third of the actual universe that we see today. Um, but yeah, uh, a perfect analogy for the cosmic, uh, I mean, for the structure of the universe is a piece of Swiss cheese where our holes are our voids and the actual cheese substance is the dense uh, material substances that you see in, in the universe. So that's a good analogy to keep in mind. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we uh, focused on supernova, uh, specifically uh, CCSN type supernova, uh, which is uh, well, supernova overall is just uh, basically a stellar explosion. It's the uh, the ending of a star, I guess you could say. Uh, so we focus mainly on CCSN type supernova, which are these core collapse supernova. And as, as the way it sounds, it's uh, basically when a star's core begins to collapse down and then eventually, you know, explode. Uh, so a lot of what we focused on are everything above the green bar that you see here. And uh, particularly with CS CCSN types, uh, they are higher in mass and uh, shorter in lifespan. So we see more occurrences, occurrences of these uh, CCSN type supernova uh, compared to its low mass uh, uh, constituents here. Uh, and reason for it is just they, they run through their fuel a lot more quickly uh, and is why we get the shorter lifespan for those but a greater and brighter uh, explosion. Yeah. Uh, here is the star formation rates of these uh, supernova. As you can see, they're also uh, labeled uh, in terms of the lifespan here on the left side. Uh, as you go down, of course, you get uh, a larger 
right a longer lifespan for these these stars. But starting off, the uh, the all the information that we collected for our, for this research is from the Open Supernova Catalog and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, the Open Supernova Catalog is basically a whole big big old data set of uh, of all the discovered supernova that we detected up until this point, and we use that alongside uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, it does uh, generally the same thing as well, but it gives us uh, extra information on the luminosities or the brightnesses of these stars that we used to, uh, for our research here. Uh, so basically, uh, what my project, I guess the setup uh, of this was the, we kind of basically chucked these supernova into these void and wall environments or uh, dense and under dense environments uh, and compared to see, uh, compared those, uh, compared both to see how uh, the supernova rates uh, fluctuate between uh, between both, uh, just to see if anything, if just to see if the uh, voids actually have an uh, affect the overall star formation rate for a supernova here um, for a star. Uh, and so throughout the um, so here are, are we got a graph graphs of these distributions of host luminosities. Basically, uh, we tried to match. Uh, each uh, some of the supernova with its own host galaxy, or just a little part partner them up, just to see uh, how they uh, are affected in that environment, right? Uh, and so, on the diagram you see on to the left, you see this weird uh, double like peak uh, image uh, that, that was a little odd in in our samples because we did not expect that. So we knew something was something funky was going on. So we decided to switch over to a different uh, matching option in SDSS that, uh, that allocates for these, uh, these, these host galaxies. Uh, and we actually see that it tapers down a lot more, which is not a lot nicer uh, and a better sample. So we know that SDSS was basically matching these random objects in the sky with our, with our supernova, which is something we didn't want. Uh, and so in order to, uh, Get a bit better peak here. Well, I used uh, SDSS's object search. Uh, it's basically the uh, just uh, and I yeah. It's an SDSS ob object search that uh, that, that can manually uh, match these host galaxies to the supernova uh, and see. And, and from there, I got a better sampling and a better uh, peak uh, or one whole profile peak here, which is a nicer and cleaner sample that we got. Um, as well, here's the uh, sky distribution of all the supernova. Uh, basically, if you kind of look at the up, up into the sky, this is kind of generally where all these supernova or all, uh, all the data was sampled into. Uh, as well, you can see that everything that's in the uh, it's considered inside a wall, a void, outside, so outside, and in the edge. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, so the results from this were that uh, we actually found a higher rate or supernova rate in voids uh, overall. And we also observed them in different luminosity bins. In this case, just uh, looking at stars uh, starting from dwarfs and going up to brighter and brighter, uh, brighter stars uh, to see uh, if this, uh, if this uh, rate actually is consistent throughout the whole thing. And we, we do see that there's a, a higher rate Overall, for uh, in voids compared to those in walls, uh, basically allowing us to uh, uh, observe that there might be a, a, this shift in the in, in, in the initial mass function. Uh, uh, basically, what the initial mass function is here is it's the distribution of uh, between low and high mass uh, low and high mass stars uh, given in that set population of those stars. And we see that there's an actual shift here uh, from the original uh, predictions uh, in that darker, uh, in that darkened line there uh, compared to here. And so we know that there might be a difference in star formation rate uh, and uh, as well as, as to our initial mass function. Um, but yeah, that's uh, basically uh, all the, the uh, everything I did over the summer uh, and to talk about, then the thing, um, per my, sorry about that, I'm a little nervous. Uh, but yeah, uh, overall, my REU experience uh, was just, it was, it was awesome. Uh, 
I got great help from Calbridge and the application process was, uh, was, it was a lot uh, easier and more uh, coherent to follow uh, because of Calbridge. So I got to give thanks. Uh, and also I learned so much uh, on research uh, programming as well. Uh, learned a lot about Python uh, and I went in without knowing anything at all. Uh, so they helped me along the way uh, with, with my programming as well, and as well as balancing my uh, work-life schedule uh, as well. Um, and I got to go to places like uh, the State Park in Ithaca. And uh, this is one of the libraries on the left, uh, left picture, uh, the libraries at the, at the uh, at, at campus at the University of Rochester, which was pretty nice. I, always, I love going there all the time. But yeah, uh, thank you for your time, guys. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. And since we aren't in person, I'll clap sort of on behalf of everyone. Um, so great job. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, are there any questions from the audience? We have time to take, take a couple questions. So maybe I'll ask a quick one, and this is just make, to help make sure I understood what you said properly. So could you go back to your slide when you had the two plots? Um, I just want to make sure. So yeah. you were you said you were using the two different um, sources basically to have these two plots. Is that so? You're actually looking at different a different oh. set of galaxies in these two. Is that right? So uh, yeah, so we do use both of these uh, from both sources. We do use a uh, uh, SDSS in this case uh, to get these plots because they uh, measure because the information they give us is on uh, the brightness or the luminosities on the stars, uh, or and so right so we use that to to get these plots and um, so and they thought like the for the one on the left that there was maybe like noise like they were getting other luminosities yeah it was something something weird with the with the matching that that SDSS went through that was really odd that we didn't uh, quite understand why. And so when we did make that switch over to this uh, this matching option that allows for uh, to match with photometric and spectroscopic properties, uh, we actually tapered down that uh, that our, our results a little bit more, making it a lot more cleaner. Uh, okay. uh, and then um, so and then in the end, you said you did find that in voids, there were more frequent supernovae. Is that correct? Yeah, so do, do, do they have speculation why that might be or uh, the believe, why is like a whole different question, but uh, I believe uh, if I remember correctly, I guess the reason for why we have these uh, uh, these higher rates right in voids is because voids uh, create uh, an environment for our for our, our stars or for the star formation rate to, I guess, increase a little bit more faster. Uh, creating these more, uh, seeing these super, making ah, making us see these supernova more frequently. Uh, oh, I, I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. You know. Yeah, and I, I think it's due to some special, I guess, gas in the in the voids that 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 help like create this like, uh, like ideal lattice. environment for them to happen or something. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, are there any other questions from the audience? Also, it could just be a question about RUs, University of Rochester. Would you do an RU again, you think, Juan, next summer? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, I have a question. Yes. So my experience was completely online, um, which I'll talk about a little bit, but how like did you enjoy getting to do it in person? Oh, yeah, it was actually, yeah, it was really good because um, the I guess the mask mandate over there in New York uh, wasn't uh, as strict, so we were able to like really be uh, in a closed I guess in, uh, uh, environment I guess you could say. Uh, so we really got to meet uh, each other face to face with no face mask, but of course everyone had to be uh, vaccinated, right? Um, and so overall. It, the in person was just it was just a nice touch to really like get back into uh, get back into things. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Johan. I think um, we'll go on to our next talk. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned CalBridge at the end because I forgot to mention at the top of the talk, all four of our speakers today are actually CalBridge scholars. So, um, so Natalie is a senior CalBridge scholar, and then Juan, Katie, and Andrew are all um, junior CalBridge scholars. So, so congratulations to all of you guys on, on that fellowship. For those of you who don't know, the CalBridge Scholarship is a program for students in physics and astronomy who are planning on to go on to PhD programs. So, so if you're interested in that, these are great people to ask, ask about that program, or you can also ask me. All right, so I think we'll go on to our next talk. Um, so if you don't mind stopping, great, thank you. Um, and as I mentioned, unfortunately, this is a speaker who can't be here today. Um, so we won't be able to ask her questions, but uh, hopefully you're all very excited to hear hear about her talk anyway. So I want to share sound. Oh, sorry. Too many things open. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that and Katie's up there in the right hand screen, you know, she could she you could have thought she was here I could have probably fooled you all if I wanted to. Alright, so Katie Toman is also a junior but she's an astrophysics BS and she worked at Caltech this summer and so she's going to tell us about her work there. Hi everyone, my name is Katie Toman and I'm a junior majoring in astrophysics and minoring in math. I participated in the WAVE Fellows Program at Caltech this summer under the guidance of Professor Dimitri Maway and Dan Echeverry of the Exoplanet Technology Lab. And this presentation is about vortex fiber nulling. A quick overview of the presentation includes background info of similar techniques and long-term goals for the project, along with an explanation of how our design is different from others. The methods and approach slide will provide insight to the simulation work I've done and expand on previously completed parts of the project, which will then lead into the results of these simulations. And leading away from simulated work, the Keck Planet Imager and Characterizer slide will illustrate the in-lab hands-on work I was able to do as well. Vortex fiber nulling is a new interferometric technique for characterizing exoplanets at small angular separations from their host star. Interferometry is a technique in which waves are superimposed to cause interference, which we use to extract information. VFN is particularly worthwhile because it allows exoplanet characterization at or within the theoretical diffraction limit of telescopes, a factor two to three times better than conventional chronographic techniques. The diffraction limit of the telescope is the minimum angular separation of two sources, like a star and a planet, that can be distinguished by the telescope, and it's constricted by the diameter of the telescope. Traditional fiber nulling interferometers use sub-apertures, while VFN has the advantage of using the entire telescope aperture. In other words, VFN is able to use the entire diameter of the light collecting region instead of making sub-regions. By using vortex fiber nulling, we can differentiate light from the host star and light coming from a planet orbiting it. To do this, we use something similar to, coronograph to conventional coronographic methods. The top right graphic shows how one of these conventional chronographs works. We see that the coronagraph mask is placed within the beam of light that is coming from our star system. Once the mask is in place, a lot of the starlight is blocked, with the remaining light being focused to the edges. A LEO stop is then added to block most of the remaining starlight, and as a result, the starlight is suppressed to the point where the planet is now visible since it's not behind the star's glare. This light will be used to characterize the atmospheric composition of these planets using spectroscopy. In this process, the planet light will be input through a spectrometer, which will measure the properties of light over a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and the output will be something similar to the image on the bottom right. This technique serves to search for key molecules, known as biosignatures, in the planet's atmosphere, such as methane, water, and carbon dioxide, and these results could allow for us to characterize potentially habitable Earth-like exoplanets. Now looking at VFN's specific instrument design, we can see that the starlight and planet light are coming in and passing through the vortex mask at different angles. This is shown in red for the star and blue for the planet. The vortex, as used in VFN, is distinct from how a typical coronagraph mask is used. In the last slide, the starlight was physically blocked by the coronagraph, while in VFN we let the light get to the final imaging plane. It will come to a focus on the center of the line within the gray block on the right. This line is the single-mode fiber, or SMF, as labeled in the diagram. 
Now remember the coronagraph mask and Leo stop work together to completely block the starlight coming through. Even though the vortex mask does not block the starlight, the starlight in red lands exactly on the center of the fiber, making it symmetric in a way that the star's phase cancels out, meaning you don't get any of the starlight in. Now looking at the blue line for the planet light, we see that it lands off center on the fiber, making it asymmetric such that the planet light will get in. My project for the summer was to see what kind of planets VFN can detect, and more specifically, create a list of stars to look at when we start observing with VFN next year. To do this, I started with a previously generated list of promising targets for the VFN mode of KPIC. I expanded on an existing code for running simulations that now utilizes actual parameters, such as mass, diameter, and temperature for each star. Looking at the graph on the left, we see that there is separation on the x-axis and mass on the y-axis. This graph shows the mass and separation for a companion object directly. Data from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission was taken to create these graphs for, who, for stars whose accelerations are not in a straight line. A non-linearly accelerating star could mean that there is a companion, like a planet, near the star causing that motion. Graphs like these were made for each of the 67 target stars to try to explain their accelerations. If we look at a separation of about 70 milliarc seconds, Gaia data predicts that we will have a planet with a mass of 11, to 11 Jupiter masses. This entire graph shows the probable separations and masses for a companion planet, if that is in fact what's causing the star's acceleration. And the graph on the right shows the outcome of one target star that has been run through the simulation. By looking at the white contour lines, we can clearly see that this would be highly detectable for KPIC VFN, since the majority of the graph is above the SNR ratio line of 5.0. For this specific star, this graph shows us that we should be able to detect a companion planet of at least three Jupiter masses and at a separation of up to 80 milliarc seconds. Without even looking at the x and y axes, we can look at the contour lines and see that most of the graph is above the 5.0 contour line, making this star a promising target for KPIC VFN. Now combining those two separate plots, we created a final sensitivity grid for each of our target stars. Now overlaid, we can more clearly see with what mass and at what separation a planet would likely be at orbiting our host star. The parameters on the side that are in bold were taken from online catalogs. For every single star in our target list, our code goes online to pull the information measured and contained in the test input catalog and the two mass all sky catalog of point sources. The parameters for the companion object were chosen using evolutionary models that predict how a planet evolves over time using the host star's age and the planet's mass. And the final parameters on the bottom we are assuming for our observations. To highlight from the previous slide, the purple region is the most probable planet mass as predicted by Gaia astrometry data, and the background in shades of blue and green is how detectable that planet would be with anything above an SNR of 5.0 considered detectable. So to look at this contour of 5.0 again, you can see that this companion planet that's a member of our actual target list would be detectable with KPIC VFN as long as the acceleration seen by Gaia is being caused by a real companion, and as long as the planet exists within a separation of about 100 milliarc seconds. Within this range of 100 milliarc seconds, we see that this planet is above 5.0, which means it's detectable, but it's also above 100, which means it is very detectable. And with these very detectable planets, we can do advanced spectroscopic methods to determine things like this planet's spin and the weather if it has clouds, how quickly the clouds are moving, and what the clouds are made of. Most current coronagraphic systems are limited to looking at separations beyond 100 million arc, arc seconds, so they would not be able to see or detect this planet if it existed in this region. This region to the left of the 100 million arc second yellow line is a region that only KPIC VFN and a few other techniques currently being developed will be able to detect, and I'm very proud to say that KPIC VFN might be the first one to be able to look at these regions on sky. I actually got to work on the physical KPIC 2 instrument with the whole plate imaged at the center. A very simple run through of this plate is that the yellow cord is the light source being used in the lab. <clears throat> the light travels through the system, hitting each of the mirrors that have been perfectly adjusted for maximum light throughput. The light is collimated and brought to focuses throughout the instrument and finally lands on the camera attached to the back. By performing characterization tests, we can gain insight on how the moving parts of the plates will behave over time. For the first test I performed, I moved the tip tilt mirror shown in the left image to its maximum point and moved it down incrementally to see if it moves linearly or has some erratic movement in that range. This mirror moves exactly as its name describes. 
It tips and tilts, which changes the direction of the light. The image on the right shows the retractable fiber stage with a yellow optical fiber in place. This stage can retract horizontally to move the light source in and out of the entire optical system. And the test I performed on this stage was to move the stage in and out of the system and see the relative motion in X and Y with respect to the original image. And the next test that I did was to physically remove the optical fiber and replace it, which will tell us if and how the focus is changing each time it's removed. When I had presented this at Caltech the first time, the data analysis for these experiments was not yet completed. So you guys are actually the first people to be seeing this new data for the instrument, which is pretty cool. Um, I've been working remotely over the last few weeks to finish these tests and analyze the data for them. The top left image using the in-lab computer, we took 50 images each time the yellow fiber source was removed and replaced, about 20 trials. The 20 blue points plotted represent the 20 different sets of images taken and each dot is the separate trial. The dot is the mean of the data points from the 50 images, and the centroid was then calculated and is represented by the red triangle. Looking at the center image, we computed the full width half max in X and Y to tell us if the focus was changing. We did this by finding the center of the image and having our code output the coordinates for the center. After normalizing the data, we plotted a crosscut through the PSF. We inspected the data around these 0.5 amplitude point and determined exactly when the PSF's amplitude crossed this threshold on both sides. From these pixel values, we determine the full width half max. Our result is about 10% above the theoretical value of 4 pixels, and the standard deviation is about 15%, which may seem large, but the focus is very sensitive, so small motions like this in the fiber tip can actually cause large changes. And lastly, the image on the bottom right is from an experiment used to test the repeatability of the light source being moved in and out of the system. The question to answer was, if the stage is moved in and out of the system repeatedly, can the scatter remain below 2 lambda over d? The experimental procedure was the same as the previous, except the fiber source was not physically removed, but moved in and out of optimal position by moving the entire fiber stage. As we see in the image, the scatter is well below 2 lambda over d in both x and y, meaning that, the moving, that moving the stage returns the PSF to nearly the same position with negligible change. In conclusion, the VFN mode of the Keck Planet Imager and Characterizer will be able to look at exoplanets with small angular separations from their host star, much smaller than any existing coronagraphic technique. A promising target list for the instrument's first light can be made using the sensitivity grids that tell us the mass and at what separation a planet would need to be at in order to be detectable with KPIC VFN. Future steps for the project include creating a list of stellar binaries given parameters for VFN detectability using the Washington Double Star Catalog, and finishing the data analysis for the tip-tilt mirror. I recently co-authored a paper on VFN, which is available on the SPIE Digital Library. If you go to the SPIE website through Sonoma's library online, you'll be able to read the paper for free. You can either search my name or the title of the paper, which is Broadband Vortex Fiber Nulling, High Dispersion Exoplanet Science at the Diffraction Limit. I'd like to thank Professor Dimitri Maway and Dan Echeverry for their insight and guidance throughout the summer. I have learned a great deal from them and look forward to their upcoming work on this project. I'd also like to thank the funders of the Joseph Rhodes Jr. Way Fellowship, Jim and Marcy Beck for their support and interest in scientific development. And now for the REU application process and my overall experience. I had applied to a few REU programs in 2019 and didn't get into any of them, which is a bit discouraging. And so I didn't apply in 2020 either, which worked out okay because of COVID. Um, but I wasn't gonna apply this year either because I didn't think I'd get into any of them due to only taking lower division physics courses and not having any programming experience. Um, but my community college ad advisor and Professor Miller were encouraging me to apply. And you know, even if you don't get accepted to any of them, you'll have more experience with the applications and you'll get your name out there. So I applied through the links on the National Science Foundation's website for REUs, but I also applied through the CalBridge Campare program, which sends out your application to a few different places. I ended up getting into Caltech's program through Campare, even though I wasn't a CalBridge scholar yet at that time. Um, I had very little hope of getting into any of the programs and honestly thought that there was an application mix-up when I got the Caltech Fellowship acceptance email. 
Um, I learned that a lot of students felt that imposter syndrome the first few weeks because you kind of ask yourself why you're there when you think there's other people that are more qualified um, than you. But remember that your mentors have read your applications and they've read your letters of recommendation. They know exactly what knowledge you're coming in with and a little bit about your personality from the letters too. Uh, nobody expects you to know everything. Even the grad students and postdocs that you'll work with don't know any like everything because it, it's still a learning experience for everybody. Um, you might also be thinking about how you won't have downtime or a summer if you're doing intense research. Um, but your mentors are normal people and they understand taking breaks and they understand burnout and they might even have barbecues for the lab group over summer too. Um, make connections with all these people and get to know them personally and do not be afraid to tell them about your other interests. Uh, like I mentioned, I had no programming experience going into this and that's what the entire project was supposed to be for me, but I was open about my interest in optics and more in lab work and ended up working in the optics lab for about half the time. And I'm still continuing um, to do remote optical exper experiments. Um, and as you can see, I'm way too happy to be in a hairnet and lab coat, but it was worth it because I was in lab. Um, so just make sure that, that you make connections with those people and also other people that are in your program. Um, yeah, thank you all for listening to this talk. And I have my email at the bottom for any comments or questions you may have about this project or my research or my experience. So thank you. All right, and I'll leave this up for a second so that if you do actually want to email Katie, you can see her her email is here down at the bottom. Um, I'm really glad she added all of that at the end, because if there's anything I can say, even if you're not sure, just applying to things is always worth worth a try. Um, I would say she mentioned that earlier on she didn't get accepted and perhaps that is because her for most REUs, you probably want to have completed both 114 and 214 physics. So if you're earlier in your career than that, then it might be a little too early. But once you've finished at least those two classes, we've seen, I think Juan at the time, you had only finished 114 and 214, right? So both Juan and Katie got these positions with only those two, the first two semesters of general physics. So, um, so definitely, definitely it never hurts to apply. All right, so next we have uh, Natalie Sanborn, who is also a Calbridge scholar. Like I said, it's all Calbridge scholars, it turns out. Um, who is a senior in our program. So she's graduating next semester, so woohoo. Um, and she is a astrophysics BS and also is, she's doing the math minor. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, um, so I presented this a couple of weeks ago at the Calbridge Symposium, um, but my topic is simulating 21 centimeter epoch of reionization foregrounds. I worked with Dr. Jonathan Popair and grad student Jacob Berba um, at Brown University, but I did everything remotely. So some of the background and motivation for my research. Um, the kind of overarching background is the cosmic microwave background, which shows the early stages of the universe. Um, and with that is the epoch of reionization, which is when hydrogen atoms became reionized and started forming stars and galaxies and clumps of material in the universe. Um, observed with this is the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. So this 21 centimeter line is produced by a change in the hydrogen energy state and the HERA collaboration that I worked with, their main focus is looking for this 21 centimeter hydrogen line in the data. Um, so with my project, we wanted to figure out a little bit more about distinguishing the foreground signals from the background, because that'll help isolate the 21 centimeter signal so that can be seen. So I have a bit of a visual diagram here because it's really hard to understand um, kind of the real motivation for what I was gonna do without the visual. So as you can see in this example, we have two telescopes, telescope A and telescope B, and a star right at zenith, so the one in the red, um, which is straight above the telescopes. The signal from that star will hit both telescopes at about the same exact time because it has the same distance to travel to get to each one because it's right in between them. 
but a star a little bit further out on the sky, like the one in blue, will take a lot longer to hit telescope A compared to telescope B. So there's what's known as a delay signal in there. And it just kind of describes how the different timing is. And if we know how the timing changes based on where the stars are, it'll help us understand exactly what the signal is. So my research focused on confirming the intuition with data that the signal can be seen that the ones further out did actually hit the telescopes at different times. So I used data from the GLEAM catalog, which is the Galactic and Extragalactic All-Sky Murchison Wide Field Array from the w MWA telescope. Um, this was a catalog of real data, which was exciting to work with. Um, and I used simulations through PiUV Sim because real data can be really messy to work with if it's in real time. But through simulations, I was able to cut the data to a few different sections and analyze each section on its own so we can see those different delay spectra. So I have um, a diagram showing kind of the three sections that I was working with. So everything from straight at zenith to 10 degrees out, so that's the section in red, and then everything even 10 degrees further, so that's the one in yellow, and then 10 degrees further out again is the ones in blue. And we're hoping to see that the ones in blue have the greatest delays and the ones in red have the smallest. So using my data, I was able to confirm this intuition. Um, with the data, we use a Fourier transform of the frequency data, and that gives the delay spectrum. And the delays, like I was saying, show how long it takes the signal to get to each antenna, the difference between when it hits one antenna compared to the others. So I use the same color system. The ones in red are the ones closest to Zenith. The ones in yellow are a little bit further out, and the ones in blue are even further out. And you can see on the x-axis is the delay in nanoseconds. And as expected, the ones in blue have the largest delay and the ones in red have the smallest delay. Um, so it was really great that we were really able to just confirm the intuition and use the actual data to show exactly what we expected to see. And a little bit about my experience with CHAMP. CHAMP is the Campair Hera Astronomy Minority Partnership, Campair being the Calbridge Summer REU program. Um, so CHAMP is a kind of subdivision of that that works specifically with the HERA collaboration. Um, HERA is a radio astronomy telescope in South Africa. I have a picture of it. It's this giant hexagon um, that's just an array of a bunch of different radio telescopes. So like I was saying, you can really tell how the signals would hit each telescope differently because some of them are really far apart. Um, one thing I liked about the CHAMP program was I came in with not much experience. I had learned a little bit about, you know, um, physics in my classes and programming using Python. I had some background knowledge, but I really didn't feel prepared for an entire um, summer working with this. So the CHAMP boot camp was the very first two weeks of the summer. We spent um, hours every day just learning about the background about HERA, about radio astronomy and cosmology and the 21 centimeter line, everything about that. Um, and then more in-depth learning about programming specifically in Python and how we could use that with our data, um, which was really helpful for me because it made it easy to come in without a lot of background experience and get that at the beginning. And even with that, I still didn't feel completely ready to go into the entire summer. But we took things really step by step the whole summer, and so um, I was able to really learn as I went. Uh, something else I really liked about CHAMP was we had a mentorship program. Every week we would meet with a mentor who wasn't at the university we were working with. Um, so I met with a mentor who wasn't from Brown University, and she was a graduate student, um, just for more of like a personal mentorship um, to talk about kind of just how things were going. and research um, how the experience was going with the research. We also had HERA social hours, which was cool because um, we got to know other people in the HERA collaboration, you know, some of the other CHAMP students, and we would like play games and just have conversations to really build those connections because it was an entirely remote experience, um, which wasn't ideal, but 
I think they did really well with what we had. Um, and kind of we got to know each other a little bit better, even though we were all working in our own hometowns. So what I really enjoyed about this was that, like I said, I was able to learn through experience. I feel like I understand so much better how to work with Python, how to use data to create plots. Um, the figure I have here was the very first plot I created um, once I actually started the research. And I had no idea what I was doing at that point. Um, it was kind of like the simplest thing I could do. I knew about right ascension and declination coordinates. Um, so I just took the whole Gleam catalog and just plotted it on this graph. And the I had no idea what I was looking at because it looked a little bit weird. But the gaps in there turns out are from the galactic plane and some Magellanic clouds because those just make the data way too messy. So they just took those out completely. Um, but I was really excited about this first graph they created. I showed like my parents, my friends. I was like, look, I made something. Um, so that was really fun. And then I enjoyed getting to do real physics research. Um, it's something that I didn't get to do as much in my classes. And I was able to get paid for it. So it's like I felt almost like a real physicist at that point. Um, the mentorship and support was really helpful with all of the stress that comes with kind of almost being thrown into this experience. Um, feeling like you don't have enough background was really common, kind of like Katie was talking about with her talk. Um, but there was so much support and I felt really guided through and like everyone was making sure that I was understanding each step before we got to something more complicated. And there was a good sense of community going on with those social hours and the mentorship. And there were, I think, 10 other CHAMP students um, and we all did like the CHAMP boot camp together. So we got to know each other a little bit, um, not as much probably as it would have been if it was in person, but it was still pretty good with, we worked with what we had. Um, so yeah, that's everything for my presentation. If there's any questions, please go ahead. All right, in behalf of everyone in the audience, thank you so much, Natalie. That was a great talk. Um, I just want to say that last image, I feel like it could be like, you could print it out and frame it and call it modern art, you know? <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. Um, so does anyone have any questions in the audience? Yeah, I actually have a quick question. Um, earlier in the presentation, you showed this one image that was, it was showing that the delay was longer and it had like a, a blue, yellow, and a red curve. And I was just wondering how that, uh, how that uh, graph gave you the intuition that the delay was longer. Yeah, so this, the math behind this was really complicated. I asked about it um, with the Fourier transform. And they kind of told me, it's OK if I don't completely understand it right now. It's just something we know we can use to make it work. Um, because originally, it was the x-axis was frequency. Um, but then with that transform, it turned into delay. So uh, can you see my mouse at all? Yes. OK. Um, so on the x-axis, we have the delay. Um, and you can see like the blue over here, it kind of extends a little bit further out. Um, and that is showing that the delay on some of those are longer. Um, the other thing was, here, I can go back to my diagram here. Um, the reason that some of the delays for like, let's say the blue section, some of those delays are still super short. Um, these ones, these are still pretty short delays. And the reason for that being, those would be stars um, that were like perpendicular to the telescopes. Um, so they still fell in like a circular range of outside of like the 10 degrees from Zenith. Um, but because they were perpendicular, they were still hitting the telescopes at the same time. Um, but yeah, so the, the lines extend further out and that's how we can see that the delay is a little bit longer. Awesome, thank you. All right, great. And I think we should actually stop there so that Andrew has enough, enough time, so. Um, Andrew Evans is a, a junior. He's a double major in math and physics, um, and he'll be tell, telling us about his work this summer. So welcome, Andrew. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, again, so I'm going to hop right into it. Uh, my research this summer was on using higher order boundary conditions to improve gravitational waveforms from binary black hole simulations. So I'm going to give a little quick review first. First, we're going to talk about what is SPEC the tool we use to simulate space-time, why we want to simulate, 
Then I have to go over some terms and definitions because it's going to get a little technical. Then we're going to talk about boundary conditions and what my work was on specifically, the results from implementing the boundary conditions, and then my work this summer. Because I actually, I did an RU not this previous summer, but also one before that where I worked with this group. So I've had kind of a continuous long work with this group. And so my work comes both before and after this summer. All right. So starting off, the spectral Einstein code is a three plus one formulation of the Einstein equations. So basically, you could think about that as uh, the simulation takes uh, basically slices of space time. It takes the three dimensional spatial slice and then uses evolution equations to move through time. So it kind of evolves through these time slices. And on each slice, you can move around using the usual rules of general relativity. Um, but if you want to change time, you have to you have to actually go to a different step. And then this will be useful later, but you see they all have this, this vector that's going through them, and that's the normal vector, and they're all kind of aligned on with the same normal vector. And that, that'll be important later. So why why do we want to simulate? Well, it's it's very useful for predicting uh, what type of gravitational waveform is going to come from uh, different events, and also it helps us classify uh, what we see. So here we have uh, in the bottom left the actual detection in 2016 when LIGO picked up the first gravitational wave, and laid on top of it is the prediction that SPEC made of what that gravitational waveform would look like from the, from the uh, expected object. Uh, which was a, a binary black hole system. And as you can see, it fits pretty well. So it helps us get some intuition on what created that waveform. Um, and then the Penrose diagram is here on the right, uh, just to point out that currently the way we extrapolate the waveforms uh, actually extrapolates it to space-like infinity. And there's work on getting that to be uh, future null infinity, which is actually more, more what we would see with gravitational waves than space-like infinity. I can talk about that more uh, if there's questions afterwards. Okay, so we have to talk about some definitions because some stuff is going to get kind of technical here. So capital Phi here, that's our Reggie Wheeler Zerilli scalars. Um, and you can basically think about that as kind of like a wave formulation of the Einstein equations. I, it, that's a little uh, lax on the details, but for now we can ignore that. And then uh, Psi is our uh, Vial scalars. Um, and that's, again, pretty complicated, but you can kind of think about it as like a wave formulation or a wave equation, sorry. Uh, and then they both have uh, they both have uh, spherical harmonics. In fact, they're spherical harmonic tensors. Uh, but I'm going to be excluding that because I think it's a little uh, redundant and it would make the math look a little scarier than it is. But just know that all of these have uh, little l's and m components. And then we're also going to be setting the speed of light equal to one and the gravitational constant equal to one. All right. So the current method sets the uh, sets psi zero or the time derivative of psi zero equal to zero on the boundary. So that equals with the hat means on the boundary. Um, and this method works pretty good overall. Uh, the reason it's a time derivative is to make sure it's smooth. However, there is a problem that it causes reflections uh, of gravitational radiation off the boundary, which is bad because when you're simulating these things, the gravitational radiation can actually interfere with your simulation because it's distorting space time. So to fix this, uh, higher order boundary conditions were created. Um, so, and these boundary conditions specifically are from Buckman Sarbach 2006. Um, and so here is the formula for the boundary condition. Uh, it's this complicated expression is equal to zero, uh, where that capital L is the boundary condition order. So you get to choose that. Um, and the neat part about the boundary condition order is if you have boundary condition order capital L, it will perfectly absorb gravitational radiation of mode little l equal to L. So for instance, if you have gravitational radiation of like, let's say two, three, if you have capital L is equal to three, then this equation should theoretically perfectly absorb that gravitational radiation on the boundary, which is very useful. Um, there's some problems with this, however, though. Uh, as you take that operator to higher and higher powers, you get some pretty nasty expressions. And on top of that, you get some uh, pretty large radial derivatives. And the radial derivatives pose a problem because the way we're simulating spacetime, we're taking a discrete cut of spacetime. And because we're doing that, there is a boundary. There's a place where we're not simulating. So if you look at that little cartoon slice in the bottom right, you can imagine taking a derivative 
a radial derivative between a and b, and that's perfectly reasonable. That's, that's something you could do. But taking a derivative between b and c is something that you can't do because c is outside the simulation. So trying to take radial derivatives on a boundary poses a kind of strange problem. To get around this, we reformulate these equations to be recursive and eliminate the, uh, eliminate the uh, radial derivative. And so we're left with a system of ordinary differential equations, which we can evaluate. And they're given by this recursive formula bounded by W0 being uh, phi over R and WL plus one on the boundary being zero. Um, and so with this, we actually have something that we can implement and here's our implementation. So, oh, and it's, uh, it looks like it's the GIF is a little bit farther on than it should be, but just let it repeat. So on the left, we have the current method, which is the freezing size zero. And on the right, we have the higher order boundary condition. These are actually, this is images I created. Um, and on this uh, cut of space time, we have a three, two multipolar wave, which you can kind of think about as just perturbation on space time. Okay, so as you can see, the current method causes a reflection back in. The boundary is kind of solid, whereas in the higher order boundary condition, it seems to be transparent. It almost seems like the wave leaves when actual, it's actually getting absorbed on the boundary. But um, so that was the good news. That brings us to the bad news. So um, we noticed that when there is data present at time zero on the boundary, we get some discontinuities, which cause reflections back into the computational domain. And that's a problem because those reflections will interfere with the, uh, with the simulation and thus give us bad waveforms. Um, and so this little graphic on the left here is to help visualize what's going on on the right. So on the right is actual plot of the data. But if you look at the left, uh, the colors represent our extraction radii. So extraction radii just basically means where are we measuring the data from? So uh, as you can see, looking at the right, you have some uh, you have something propagating on space-time that's uh, moving through time, and then you hit the boundary, which is red, and you get a big spike. And then you notice that the next thing, uh, the green extraction radii, also feels that spike at a later time. So from that, we can infer that the data hit the boundary, the boundary condition did something weird and that it's not supposed to, and it reflected back an amplified wave back into the center, uh, which is bad. Okay, so this actually brings, all of this was just review, and this brings me to my work this summer. So I did some visualization work using Paraview and Python, uh, and then I did analytic work looking for problems in the code and mathematics with uh, Mathematica and by hand. So the first issue that I came across was the spinning grid frame issue. So uh, the code to make it a little more complicated is actually running two simulations, one in which the grid frame, which is where we're doing our mathematics on, is spinning with the binary, and the other is uh, static. It's an inertial grid frame. And you need some way to communicate between these grid frames. And how you do this is with these normal vectors drawn in blue. And you can communicate because you know the Jacobian for the system, and it should be able to tell you how the normal vectors change between them and the inverse Jacobian to go back. Um, however, what was not accounted for is that the grid frame uh, has some nonlinearity and it's spinning, and therefore the Jacobian is going to change in time. So we have to find a way to introduce a time derivative of the Jacobian, known as the time component of the Hessian. Um, and then there was some pretty intense tensor calculus that had to go on to help solve that, which I was a part of. Um, and we were able to correct the issue and show that we could get uh, results from spinning and non-spinning grid frames to agree. The other issue I worked on was the uh, previously mentioned data on, or initial data on the boundary problem. So uh, this violates our boundary condition at time equals zero, and that's a problem. So what we have to do is find some method to smooth our initial data to our initial slice. And how we do that is what's known as compatibility conditions, or at least in this context, in engineering, they're very different, I believe. Um, so our compatibility conditions makes the boundary condition equal to a function of time. And this function of time is going to help smooth it at time zero, so there's no discontinuity. But then as time goes on, it will exponentially decay back to zero, because the boundary condition being equal to zero on the boundary is actually the best for outgoing radiation. And that's what we're trying to absorb. But at time equals zero, we have to get rid of that discontinuity. And so how we have to do that is we have to get this g of t um, and there was a lot of mathematics uh, done to figure out what this G of T was. Uh, and that's actually still currently in progress. We're still currently working on that. However, because of school, I'm, I'm a little less involved now. 
uh, but I would be happy to answer questions afterwards about that. The other issue we run across is if we're doing something at time equals zero, we can't talk about a partial time derivative. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So to get around this, we have to reformulate in terms of partial radial derivatives. Uh, this seems like a problem. However, it's only a problem on the boundary. You're, you can do it inside the computational domain. Um, and I would also be happy to talk more about why uh, we want to do that. But uh, for now, it's just simply because the time derivative won't work because we don't know what's going to happen in future steps. This summer, I was also part of another project uh, as some side work. I did this part time, but I, uh, I did two small things. In the bottom left there, you can see a, a circuit that I fabricated along with uh, I made some open source software to control that circuit, uh, to control that deposition machine that's pictured above that circuit and also to its right. Uh, so I could talk more about that if anybody's interested. But also, uh, I can also link a, uh, a GitHub page to all the work I did, include schematics and, and the code I did. And then the other small thing I worked on was uh, repairing a helium compressor for a low temperature uh, low temperature measurement device, uh, specifically a, it was a closed cycle uh, cooling unit. And so uh, pictured in the top is uh, me and some people in the REU along with the shop tech doing, uh, doing some brazing and then also the, the guts of this compressor while it's going. A uh, huge thank you to the uh, NSF Supplement Award uh, uh, listed there, and also the, the coordinators of the RU, Dr. Key and Dr. Rodriguez Hidalgo, for making this all possible. A huge thank you to uh, Dr. Luisa Buckman, who took me under her wing over a year ago now, and I've, I've learned so much about physics and research under her, and, and a huge thank you to everybody else on this list. Uh, it, my, my research wouldn't have been possible with everybody here. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Andrew, for that excellent talk. Uh, we're almost out of time here, but are there anyone, does anyone have a quick question that they'd like to ask of Andrew? Again, it could be about the research project or about RUs or being a double major in math, you know? My, sorry, I can't see the chat right. Oh, great. See. All right, well, it's actually five o'clock, so I think we'll just stop there. Um, sorry if you felt a little rushed at the end there, Andrew, you got a little bit of less time. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Again, next week, um, our WPD will be at an unusual time. It will be Tuesday at noon, um, but we'll be hearing from Dr. Dorita Holbrook, um, and they'll be telling us about their work on cultural astronomy, so that should be very, very interesting to hear about. Um, for the students who are in the class right now, I want to remind you to complete your sort of post lecture assignment, which is the discussion forum about the talks that we just heard. So don't don't forget to do that. The assignment is posted on Canvas. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything? All right, if not, thank you again to all of our excellent speakers. Great job, everyone. Um, Dr. Miller, you said um, the talk that's normally going to It'd be on Mondays at four is going to be next Tuesday at 12. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tuesday at noon instead. Um, okay. The speaker, the speaker is in, uh, in Europe, I think somewhere in the UK, I believe. Um, so, so because of time zones, 4 PM is a little late for, for, for her. So. Okay. Cool deal. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm.